Good afternoon and welcome to the Adelaide Biomed City Mini Review webinar series. Uh, my name is Andrew Zanatino and I'll be your chair this afternoon. Uh, before I start um, and introduce our first speaker, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on Ghana land uh, and uh, I want to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians on the land in which we meet here today. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to remind you at this juncture that you can use the Q&A um, section of the bottom of your Zoom window and that'll allow you uh, to ask a question of our speakers and I can relate that question to them uh, on your behalf. Uh, this afternoon uh, session is all about the prostate and uh, as an owner of a, an almost 52 year old prostate, I'm absolutely delighted to present our two speakers today and learning more about it. Um, particularly in the context of prostate cancer. Uh, our two speakers today are Professor Wayne Tilley and Professor Lisa Butler. And our first speaker is Professor Wayne Tilley. Uh, Wayne has had a long and distinguished career and is the director of the Dame Roma Mitchell Cancer Research Laboratories at the Adelaide Medical School at the University of Adelaide. He's held this role since 2002. Um, as many of you would know, Wayne is an internationally recognised uh, scientist uh, who played a major role in elucidating the mechanisms of sex hormone receptor signaling in hormone dependent cancers. Uh, when uh, Wayne was at the uh, University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, uh, he was responsible for cloning the human androgen receptor in 1989. Uh, he returned to Adelaide in 1991 and took up a position at Flinders University uh, and then moved to the University of Adelaide in 2002, where he is now. Uh, since returning to Australia, Wayne and his team have established the oncogenic role of the androgen receptor in prostate cancer, and he's also pioneered uh, investigations of the androgen receptor in breast cancer, uh, of which uh, some of that work uh, was the subject of a, um, a Nature Medicine paper earlier this year, where he was able to show the role of the androgen receptor as a tumour suppressor. Um, it's wonderful work that was published. Um, uh, and now that work has really led to, um, to the agonist therapeutic strategies that are currently in clinical trials. And it leads nicely onto the title of Wayne's presentation today, which gets a pun award. So thank you, Wayne, for it. It's agonizing over antagonizing the androgen receptor in prostate cancer. Please welcome Wayne. So thank you very much, uh, Andrew. And, uh, as uh, Andrew alluded to, I, I want to tell you a little snippet really about some of our work, but just place that, uh, and this is unpublished work, um, and it's in terms of where we think is, a, is an interesting avenue for the field to be heading. Um, but prior to that, just a, a little bit of background to set the scene. Um, so this uh, first slide just really summarizes the mechanism of androgen action in the and this is a generic slide it could be the prostate it could be any one of a number of other target tissues um, but the key point is that circulating testosterone is converted to dihydrotestosterone that's a high affinity ligand for the androgen receptor and then that then stimulates the formation of an active transcriptional complex on chromatin, which can result in growth differentiation survival. Um, so a, a range of different readouts, which largely are dictated by cell-specific co-regulators that interact with the androgen receptor. Um, I just note here that even in the prostate, you, you have a number of other nuclear receptors. Of course, testosterone can be con converted to estradiol and uh, this can bind to the estrogen receptor and, and the importance of this I'll come back to later. So as Andrew alluded to, I was uh, fortunate to clone the human androgen receptor back in the, the late 1980s and that allowed us to define the structure of the receptor but also to start identifying mutations in the receptor that were associated with either the inherited form of androgen sensitivity which is uh, by definition a loss of function of the androgen receptor or intriguingly, other mutations that occurred in the receptor that, that lead to um, activation of the receptor. And these, these mutations were what we ultimately found in prostate cancer. So to, to sort of set the scene, in, in the 1980s, when I was working in, in UT Southwestern Dallas and then early back at Flinders University, we were re really limited to androgen deprivation therapy for metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. 
And indeed, back in the, the, the 80s, many men presented almost exclusively with metastatic disease. Um, and, and so there was orchidectomy back then, there was estradiol, um, and then it emerged to GNRH analogs as means of suppressing um, testicular synthesis of androgens. And uh, this was a very effective strategy because the majority of androgen does obviously come from the testis, but there's also adrenal androgens that are important. Um, and, and then androgen ablation with GNRH analogs was combined with androgen receptor inhibitors such as flutamide. And, and this was a, a sort of a significant advance, but still survival was not particularly increased. And it was only about 2014 onwards, and it was largely as a result of the cloning of the androgen receptor that people like Charles Sawyers embarked on extensive drug development programs. And uh, this was critical in order to uh, develop new AR antagonists and, uh, and other strategies. And, and people that, uh, like Johan de Bono and colleagues in, in London also developed androgen biosynthesis inhibitors such as abiraterone, and then of course um, docetaxel emerged. And, it was really in the mid 2000s there that they, they were two instrumental advances. But the next one was Charles Sawyer's work in developing, doing the preclinical work and the clinical work to establish enzalutamide as a potent AR inhibitor. And that led to studies showing that it clearly resulted in an overall survivor benefit in, in castrate resistant prostate cancer. And by CRPC, I mean resistant to androgen deprivation therapies alone or in combination with the AR antagonist. And uh, it, critically, and it, it seems, you know, it's not that long ago really, but Enzymet was the first metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer trial to report increased overall survival with enzalutamide and with testosterone su suppression. And I mentioned this because it was a study that was pretty much led from Australia, Ian Davis from Monash and uh, Chris Sweeney, who's uh, currently in Boston. So to just quickly summarize this, what you see here is that, as I said, going, there's been this progression now to uh, this very rapid evolution of new drugs that target the androgen signaling pathway. And you can see these dates here, 2018, 19, 18, 18, 19, and, and even in the setting of first line metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, a, a number of AR targeted agents such as abiraterone and enzalutamide combined with these newer drugs that have emerged. But overall, we still see progression of metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And so th these therapies, whilst now extending life of patients, and that's terrific, are still not curative and there's still need for a better understanding and alternate therapeutic strategies. And obviously Lisa will take that up in her talk. We know from earlier work that I was involved in that there are a whole range of changes in the androgen receptor can be mutated. It can be increased due to copy number gain or upregulation. Um, there can be alternate splicing leading to constitutively active variants. There can be intracrine synthesis. And all of this provides selection pressures, adaptation, and restored signaling in the prostate, even in an androgen deprived setting, that is a castration setting. And this leads to drug resistant tumors. And so we've felt that there needs to be another way of sort of a, a going about um, approaching prostate cancer. And it, it stemmed from discussions that I had with Gail Rusbridger at Monash, and, and, and I've mentioned Ian Davis already, but also with my breast colleague, Stephen Birtwell where we, we wrote a perspective in Nature Reviews Cancer saying that in some ways breast and prostate cancer are more similar than different. They're both driven by um, oncogenes and those oncogenes are both sex hormone receptors, uh, AR prostate, ER breast cancer. Um, and so that led us sort of thinking about how we might go about it differently. And the insight really came from work that we did with Jason Carroll. Um, and that's this Nature paper we published um, with while well, we were able to fortunate to spend a bit of time with Jason at the uh, CRUK's Cambridge uh, Institute in Cambridge. And we were able to show that the progesterone receptor is very effective when activated in reprogramming the estrogen receptor alpha to different sites on chromatin. So it switches the outcome. And, uh, and, and so we postulated that by effectively pushing estrogen receptor around the genome, um, this could be a, an important new therapeutic strategy. And, and indeed, this led to three clinical trials within two years of publication of that Nature paper. 
And then as in the background of all this, we'd had a long history of working on the androgen receptor and trying to understand whether you should antagonize it in breast cancer like you tend to do in prostate cancer or whether indeed it should be agonized. And our belief was that it always that it was a tumor suppressor and that you should agonize it. And that led to this paper in Nature Medicine uh, earlier this year. And, and so I guess our central hypothesis is, is there is this tug of war between the estrogen receptor and the androgen receptor in both men and women. And sometimes antagonizing it is the optimal, but in other states, it is actually better to agonize it and really understanding how you might achieve that in prostate cancer, similar to what we've now got in breast cancer by agonizing the androgen receptor. We've got a new hormone-based therapy. We've got drugs that can stimulate it and it inhibits tumor growth. The question is, can we do this in prostate cancer? And so you've got this old AR targeting therapy, which has been effective, but it's largely like taking a sledgehammer to the androgen receptor. And the question is, as opposed to antagonizing it with more potent drugs, can we come up with new receptor ligands to agonize it? And uh, that's where we, we've really asked, well, is it possible to develop an AR reprogramming strategy for prostate cancer so that instead of just having a good initial response and eventual progression, can you come up with a new treatment that has increased survival, reduced side effects and prevent progression? And so we embarked on a major screen. This was funded by NBCF and Movember, and it was done in part with the Victorian Center for Functional Genomics. We took a large library of nuclear receptor ligands. We screened a, a number of prostate cancer cell lines, both sensitive and resistant, and even resistant to ENSA. But we used two readouts. We had to have greater than 50% growth inhibition, but we also had to see an effect on differentiation. And we used a number of different dyes and a, and a large number of parameters in a high throughput screen to achieve this. And this led to 10 lead compounds. Um, and this is just to give you an example. This is one of the lead compounds. And you can see this potent growth inhibition here. This is a cabazitaxel. That's um, growth inhibits the, force, the cell lines across all doses. And this is ribociclib, which has no effect. Interestingly, you see the effects of these drugs on morphology, markedly different effects on morphology. And we've been able to use this um, in combination with um, test compounds to actually categorize our um, uh, novel nuclear receptor ligands into specific classes. Um, and so finally, where, where do we take this? And this is where we've used a unique collection of preclinical models for validation in combination with uh, um, Gail Risbridger, Renee Taylor at Monash, and we've done some work with Lisa as well. And, and obviously Lisa was in, instrumental in developing the explant system. But we can take um, tumor from humans, we can develop um, patient-drive xenografts and go into organoids, or we can go to explants or we can even take, uh, make organoids direct from humans. So we have a plethora of models with which we can validate these new uh, reprogramming compounds. And this is just to show you one here. Um, so this is actually a, a PDX developed from a dura in a human. And then we've actually taken the explant uh, or from the, uh, the PDX and, and then we've used that to do explant culture. This is just a more efficient, um, shorter, rapid way of, and high throughput way of actually analyzing the initial material. You can see it's AR positive, and you can see this compound in, in, inhibits growth using key 67 as a marker here, and it actually uh, also induces cell death using cleave caspase 3 as an indicator of that. So with that, it's a very rapid sort of, um, introduction to a new direction that we're heading. Um, I think it's, it was telling that um, Pete Nelson from Seattle and the Fred Hutch had a paper in JCI just uh, very recently where they're also proposing that selective androgen receptor modulators, which are potent activators, the androgen receptor, um, but quite selectively also um, can quite potently inhibit prostate cancer cell growth, but they've not taken that into um, PDX preclinical models yet. So with that, I'll close um, given time, other than to thank a large number of people here, national and international collaborators and our funding sources. So with that, thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Wayne, for an excellent presentation. Um, Wayne, uh, just in the interest of time, I might just restrict our questions to a singular question, if yep. that's okay. Um, Fascinating presentation, it really fascinated by the screen that you use to identify um, novel, novel, drug, uh, no, novel drugs from your, your screening library. 
Can you tell a little bit more about the, the this notion of reprogramming and, and sort of why it's so important in terms of the features of your screen? Yeah, so what what was just striking with the breast cancer work that we did with both the progesterone receptor and the androgen receptor by two completely different mechanisms, one by physically interacting with the ER and the other by tethering critical co-regulators, that we could actually, by activating the PROAR, we could relocate the estrogen receptor to completely different sites on chromatin that actually switched them from activating growth survival cell cycle genes to apoptotic um, genes that would actually be beneficial and, and also differentiation genes. And so we've tried to, now having characterized those mechanisms um, in breast cancer, we've, we've actually believed that there was no reason why we couldn't do the same. It's just that we don't, we didn't really know what all the other key nuclear receptors were. So that's why we took this, did this unbiased screen, if you like, of a very large number of nuclear receptor ligands and their analogs. And uh, sure enough, that did identify a number and some novel nuclear receptors in the prostate. And now we're in the process of proving that not only their efficacy is uh, durable, but also it is via these reprogramming mechanisms. And we all already have some evidence indeed that you can reprogram the AR cystrome in uh, prostate cancer using some of these new drugs. So it's sort of switching away from antagonizing to agonizing, which means that could be done sequentially with current AR target therapies, or it might be able to be combined with other therapeutic strategies. Thanks so much, Wayne. That was a really fascinating presentation. I, I wish you well with the with the um, Thanks, work Andrew. leading to the clinical trials. Thank you so much. Um, that uh, leads us on to our second presentation for this afternoon, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to to introduce uh, Professor Lisa Butler. Uh, Lisa is a Cancer Council Principal Research Fellow at the University of Adelaide, and heads the Prostate Cancer Research Group here at SAMRI. Um, she holds a PhD in Cancer Biology uh, from the University of Adelaide with postdoctoral training in preclinical drug development at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Centre in New York, and was uh, prior to her current uh, clinical uh, principal research fellow role, um, held a ARC future fellow between 2014 and 18. Lisa's research focused on uh, novel approaches to target androgen signaling therapeutically in prostate cancer and on biomarker discovery in, a drug, in drug development. Lisa has established a tra translational research program uh, that leverages her unique preclinical models involving primary clinical samples, prostate biobanking, and proof of, proof of concept clinical trials. And again, an award for punny titles again for you, Lisa, just like Wayne, and uh, in, the, in that she's, it's called Cutting the Fat, Targeting Metabolism in Prostate Cancer. So uh, welcome, Lisa. Thanks, Andrew, and uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I have to give my uh, one of my students credit for the title, so uh, they're always good at thinking of these things. So today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the work that we've been doing looking at lipid metabolism in, in prostate cancer. So just uh, extending on Andrew's intro introduction, uh, my team is very multidisciplinary, uh, shown down the bottom here. We really have a, a great group of uh, researchers, students, research nurses and tissue coordinators uh, who do the work in our lab, but also uh, we host the SA node of the Australian Prostate Cancer Bioresource in which we collect uh, prostate specimens and clinical information from men undergoing surgery here in Adelaide as part of biobanking, but also uh, tissue-based research, as, as Wayne mentioned. Uh, our team also more broadly leads uh, a couple of uh, important international collaborations, uh, in, including a program grant from November, which is focused on lipid metabolism in prostate cancer. And that features a number of uh, fairly familiar faces here uh, locally, but also nationally and experts in lipid metabolism and prostate cancer clinical management internationally as well. So my group's very focused on, on a couple of key challenges at really both ends of the prostate cancer uh, journey. First is better informing diagnosis of prostate cancer. We know that because of PSA testing, uh, we now diagnose a, a lot of prostate cancer. In fact, Australia and New Zealand have the highest incidence. And uh, unfortunately, that's created a bit of a, what we call a pseudo epidemic of prostate cancer, because we know that a lot of those cancers are likely to be indolent and never cause problems in patients. And yet the treatment of prostate cancer causes a lot of uh, side effects that are, that are really serious. So 
uh, we want to try and avoid that over treatment and, and identify which are the most aggressive cancers to, to treat and which should just be left alone. At the other end of the spectrum, as you heard from Wayne, uh, we're really keen to improve treatments and delay resistance for those very high risk and also metastatic uh, cancers, which unfortunately remain incurable. We still don't understand why it becomes resistant to that hormonal therapy uh, in full and what are some better treatments for that, uh, that stage of disease. So, uh, you know, this was a really interesting opportunity for me to, to couple my knowledge of androgen uh, receptor biology, which is the key driver of prostate cancer through my work with Wayne, with really starting to look at lipid metabolism. And the reason that we focused on, on lipid metabolism was because, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that in, in most different types of cancers, the bulk of both biology uh, work, discovery work, and drug development is very much focused on the genomic and um, sometimes the transcriptomics and proteomic features of cancer cells themselves, not of other cell types. Uh, and it's also um, clear that in prostate cancer in particular, it's a little bit unusual in the sense that there aren't huge numbers of genomic alterations, particularly at early stages of disease that can direct treatment. So there's been an increasing focus further down the chain at looking at metabolites uh, and lipids being one of those. And, and the reason for that is because it's these sort of metabolites in the body not only integrate information from the genome and the transcriptome and proteome, but also uh, the environmental cues. So a lot of them are listed here, but of particular interest, you'll, you'll uh, see our old friend here, uh, that lipids are very sensitive to androgen levels. And so that's particularly then of interest in, in, uh, in androgen dependent cancers such as, as prostate and breast. So with that sort of integration of information, we believe that that provides potentially more information about the behavior of a cancer and what it might do in the future. And the concept that we've been working to is that androgenic hormones drive lipid metabolism changes and that those help uh, prostate cancers to survive and grow and, uh, and ultimately go on to be lethal. But on the other hand, we also propose that these expose some new vulnerabilities that we might be able to exploit uh, for therapy or prevention. Now, most of what we understand about lipid metabolism and cancer has come from a uh, study of cancer cell lines, and they tend to be grown in very unphysiological conditions. So something that was a bit of unique about our program was really trying to benefit from our involvement with the biobanking here, but to really focus our efforts on clinical prostate tumors. And so uh, we worked very closely with an expert lipidomic team in Belgium to extract lipids from blood and tumours from patients uh, and uh, use those to, uh, to investigate uh, whether there were lipids that were particularly associated with features of the cancer or of the patients. We're also able to exploit our um, expertise in ex vivo culture of, of prostate tumours to look at dynamic changes in, in, in the lipids in a, in a tumour. Now, the other thing that we've done is that in, in addition to standard mass spec uh, lipidomics, we've also been working here with the team at SAMRI to develop MALDI imaging to look at spatial uh, localization of, of lipids. And as you can see, that's particularly important here uh, where uh, prostate tumors are, are very heterogeneous cancers. Uh, and by working with David Lynn and his group, we really are, are coming up with ways of integrating our lipid analyses together uh, to come up with a really uh, clear and um, an accurate picture of the composition of lipids in different tumours. And here's a really nice example, I think, of the importance of using spatial features of uh, particularly solid tumours, uh, such as the prostate. If you look here, this is um, an example of a prostate tumour where the lipids, uh, lipid abundance in this particular cancer has been segmented into areas that have very similar lipid content. And if you overlay that with a tissue which has been very detailed um, in, in terms of its annotation by a pathologist, you can see very clearly that the lipid composition of these sort of stromal supportive areas of the tissue is completely different from the epithelium. And moreover, the epithelium for um, benign tissue is very different from that of cancer tissue. 
So you can see that doing a homogenate of a tissue like this is really not going to give you the information that you could get from a spatial analysis. So armed with that information, we've been able to work with pathologists to, um, to microdissect and, and look at uh, in great detail at the lipidome, as we call it, of, uh, of various prostate tumours. And this is a really nice figure here by one of my students, Shanice, uh, where we can identify specific lipids that are associated with particular features of, uh, of the cancer and, uh, and those that are, that are unique to cancer. Uh, we're also able to show using our uh, explant technology that lipid metabolism is, is dynamic. So if we culture tissues with uh, an antiandrogen, this is one of the ones that Wayne mentioned in his talk earlier. One of the cool things about working with patient tissue is that you see the same sort of variation in terms of response to drugs that you do in, um, in, in real patients. And so this gave us the opportunity to relate the response to this drug to changes in the lipidomic profile of those particular tumours. And again, working with David's group, we want to integrate that with other omics in the cancers to really try and understand what are the pathways driving those relationships. And so collectively, this work over the last few years has enabled us to identify some really new uh, and exciting metabolic targets in, uh, in clinical prostate tumours, some of which have never really been looked at before, such as lipid elongation shown here, and others that have, but have really only been looked at in cell lines. And one here that's quite exciting is fatty acid oxidation. And this is the main source of energy for prostate tumours. And, uh, and excitingly, there are a number of, of agents or inhibitors of this pathway that are approved and safe and well tolerated um, that have been developed for cardiology, for example, that we're keen to take through to clinical trials. So my last um, two slides are really just to talk about the next steps with this sort of work is, uh, you know, we're very aware that um, the field is littered with failed clinical trials, um, particularly for metabolic agents, but really for, for many different um, agents. And, and prostate cancer, that's a particular problem because uh, it's such a protracted disease. So the phase three studies are very expensive and coupled with a low success rate are really very challenging to undertake. So we need to very rapidly identify which are the best drugs to take forward into clinical trials. And we think that using the human tissues is helping us with that. We also have to have a parallel biomarker development strategies so that we know which patients are the right ones to treat and which ones shouldn't. And finally, to use more rapid proof of concept studies rather than the very long studies to get some evidence for initial efficacy of agents. Uh, which will accelerate their development and hopefully allow us to triage futile agents a bit more quickly. And this is something we're um, developing, and I'm just sort of finishing with this here, uh, where I've joined forces with uh, medical oncologist Lisa Horvath from New South Wales to develop what we call the priority network of proof of concept trials. So we've already started this in New South Wales, and our first trial has um, been uh, open for just over a year now of ribocyclib. Uh, but we're now extending this across uh, to multiple sites in, in Australia and, and Adelaide is certainly one that we've earmarked that we really are keen to, um, to progress to. Um, and so uh, this is, allows us to all sort of be recruiting together and, uh, and get through and bolt on trials of new agents as they come through. And obviously metabolic agents are ones that we're, we're really keen to try because of their established safety profiles. So with that, I'll just finish up. I think, you know, spatial analysis of solid tumours and the microenvironment is really exciting area uh, that certainly has a lot of um, state-of-the-art infrastructure here at SAMRI in terms of mass spec, but more recently uh, transcriptomics. But there are a lot of challenges in terms of analysing and integrating that sort of data. It's really at the cutting edge and those methods are really very much under development. And I think data management is going to be a major issue going ahead in terms of just the amount of data that's being generated. Uh, on the other end of the discovery side of things, I think Adelaide's really ideally set up for boutique clinical trials. And um, you know, where you know, some of those uh, steps are not quite in place yet, our multidisciplinary teams and our collaborators are, are really going to be helpful over the next few years, I think. So, so that's really where we're headed. And, uh, and finally, I'd just like to thank not only my team, but all of our, our collaborators here and overseas, as well as our funding sources and all of the patients that really have donated the tissues that made that study possible. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lisa, for a brilliant talk. Um, Lisa, I think you've 
you've hit upon something which is really at the heart of why we're conducting these Adelaide Biomed City mini reviews, and that is to really showcase the research and open up opportunities for what you describe as boutique clinical trials and using the expertise that we do have within the precinct. Um, for that, I thank you. I, look, I'm conscious of the time, but I, I feel compelled to ask you a question if, if you don't mind. That's and that's really around, around this idea of effectively what you're describing is, is an approach which is really around failing fast, in, in, in for want of a better way of just describing it, um, in that you are trying to identify those drugs because it's expensive to take a drug or a candidate drug right through to, to, uh, to, to um, getting um, out to the market. Um, so in, in doing these, it's sort of the process that you're looking at is, is essentially an in vivo patient-derived xeno, uh, or sorry, I should say a patient-derived uh, prostate tissue uh, culture system, and then moving into your PDX models and then moving into a small-scale clinical trials. Have, have I got that right? Is that the sort yes. of approach that you're using? That's right. So starting in the patient, um, doing your, your discovery there, but also then moving to a, a clinical trial as quickly as possible. And those trials are clearly not going to be powered or, or long enough to really show efficacy. But as long as we can sort of see some evidence that, you know, at the molecular level, that we're hitting the drug target, that we might be slowing proliferation or inducing apoptosis, for example, it gives you a lot more confidence in going forward into a much, you know, bigger, more expensive trial. So you will never not need those trials but you know it's just a way to sort of triage agents that are really not showing the promise that sure. we hope for. So just just as a follow-up though clearly you've got a complex tissue it's it's con, you know it contains the primary epithelial cells it's got your stroma and so forth the question I have relates more around uh, a sort of representation of what you find in your culture system is it mm -hmm. actually truly representative of what you would have extracted from the patient at the time of biopsy are you able to retain that complexity or do you find that you get outgrowth of subsets of cells within that tissue and does that then affect your your sort of screening type approaches that you use with uh, your, your drug studies well we try and keep those uh, those studies as short as possible so we try to minimize any adaptation to culture we use uh, physiological media to try and um, you know keep it as close uh, as, as possible to how it was in the patient. So we tend to go really no longer than three to four days uh, in terms of our culture. So in that time period, we don't see significant changes in, in either the lipidome or the, the structure and, and hormone responsiveness of the tissue. I think with longer culture, you certainly would start to get outgrowth of other cell types such as fibroblasts, for example. Uh, but we we intentionally sort of keep it as, as as short as possible for that reason. I could talk about this all afternoon, um, but unfortunately we need to wrap up for the afternoon. I want to again, once again, thank uh, Wayne and Lisa for some fantastic talks, talking about uh, the incredible research that's being done in the context of prostate and uh, and androgen receptor biology and lipids. So thank you so much for your presentations this afternoon. Uh, I'd encourage uh, those online to remind their colleagues that these are on. Uh, they're a fixture of our Tuesday afternoons at 4.30. I'd remind that you can to join us. Um, the success of this, uh, these, this series is really marked by the attendance of uh, online participants as such as yourself. So please ask your colleagues to join in as well. It uh, leaves me nothing more than to say, please join us next week at the uh, same bat time and same bat channel. And again, once again, thank you to Wayne and Lisa for fantastic presentations. Cheerio.